thanks for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about uh, Basse Dixhoven, um, uh, who very sadly passed away in January. And it came as a great shock to uh, the whole of mathematical community and to everyone who knew him. So I, I was one of his first students. And um, I would like to say a few words about um, uh, his work in general, but in particular his work uh, related to the topic of Harry's talk, namely the Android conjecture. So Bass uh, worked in many, many subjects, uh, number theory and um, algebraic geometry on modular curves, modular forms, um, also some algorithmic problems, um, and uh, the Android conjecture. In fact, he uh, did some seminal work on the, on the, on the problem. And uh, his ideas uh, certainly contributed to the eventual resolution of the problem. Um, Bass was in fact the first person, so the, the conjecture was formulated first by Yves Andre in, in the late eighties and then uh, by Franz Sort in greater generality in the mid nineties. And Bass was the first person to come up with uh, a strategy, a general strategy to approach the problem in full generality. And in fact, his ideas and well, his work led to the resolution of this problem uh, under GRH. Well, the eventual resolution is, um, uh, follows the approach by uh, Pila and Zania. However, uh, the ideas of Bass uh, for example, the use of monodromy and the properties of Hecker correspondences are, are still crucial uh, elements of the, uh, of the proof. So uh, most importantly, Bass was the person who isolated the uh, crucial ingredients, uh, which is uh, bounding below the degrees of uh, special points. And this, is, this will be the topic of Harris, Harris' talk. And he was, he actually published this um, as an open problem and uh, pointed out the connection with Colmer's formula, uh, conjectural, uh, which for, for the Falting's height of CM abelian varieties. And this is, this is what, this is also the crucial ingredient in, 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 the, uh, in, in the, the proof. Um, so the, the proof, uh, the, the, the proof of the final ingredient and of what you might call Bass's conjecture uh, uh, was announced in September and I'm sure he, he was very pleased to, to learn it. Um, so yes, I would say that um, Bass's passing away is a, is a great loss for, for um, the community in mathematical and of course for his family and friends and um, he'll be uh, certainly remembered. Um, well, this is what I wanted to say now over to Harry. All right, thank you, Andre. Uh, yeah, thank you for <clears throat> saying a couple of words. Uh, I personally didn't know um, him that well, but I met him once at the Fields Institute and uh, I was yeah a, a young student, younger than now, and uh, he was, uh, always very friendly and open and uh, open to discussions anyway. So, okay. Uh, thank you <clears throat> to everyone who uh, showed up to this talk. Um, I will try to give a brief uh, overview of uh, the history of the Andreot conjecture and uh, its eventual resolution last year. I I, I mean, I will give my perspective, obviously, which is influenced by my taste. And I would say that um, the, the problem or um, the, the, the eventual resolution of the problem had, of course, many ingredients and parts of it come from model theory slash transcendence theory, I would say. And this is more my turf. So I will concentrate on, on this part of, um, of the, the proof and all the people who contributed to this part, 
Of course, I will try to mention every everyone who uh, made a contribution, but please correct me in the chat or whatever if I miss something or if I forgot something. As I said, um, this presentation is heavily heavily influenced by by my own tastes. Obviously, yeah. It, uh, I guess it can't be helped. So um, I will start with an introduction, basically to everyone who maybe not ha has not even heard of the underworld conjecture. I mean, I guess there's still a lot of people. Uh, like that, uh, even, even some who, who shut up or maybe students. And then uh, I will explain, um, yeah, what the Pila-Wilkie counting theorem is. This this is perhaps even interest, interesting to people who are not interested in the under odd conjecture. We explain the pila zanya strategy, which applies in many, many situations. And uh, then uh, some ingredients that go into the pila zanya strategy and uh, well, particularly, so, so the sort of the new new ingredients come in section six, which I doubt more counting. And at the end, if there's still time, I will talk about uh, recent work of um, uh, um, that was that uh, goes perhaps a little bit beyond Andre Ort towards the pink conjecture or silver pink conjecture, and uh, mention the work of uh, of um, other mathematicians as well. Um, in particular, there are many young mathematicians who, who work on these kind of problems. Okay, so what is the underworld conjecture about? So um, we start with the lattice uh, in C. So that is, uh, it's a uh, free being group ge generated by two elements in C that are, are linearly independent. So one can really imagine this as some sort of uh, uh, lattice in, uh, in R2. But we think of it as, as being in the complex numbers. And um, then given such a lattice, we can sort of study its symmetries, I would call it, or the formal um, name for it is endomorphisms. And these are all complex numbers that if you multiply the lattice by the complex number, you stay in the, in the lattice. So multiplying by a complex number is really you scale the lattice by a certain number, then you, um, you rotate it a bit. And most of the time, so like in my second example here, if we take uh, generators of the lattice as being one and i times pi, say, uh, the only endomorphisms that preserve the lattice are the integers. Okay, so you kind of can only multiply, for example, lattice by two, and you will still stay in the lattice. Um, but there are, there are exceptions. So for example, if you take the square lattice, um, so generate by one and i, that are sort of perpendicular to each other, then you can also rotate by 90 degrees. So if you multiply by i, and you will still stay in the lattice. I hope um, that's kind of visual enough. And uh, we say that if this happens, if this endomorphism ring, so this endomorphism form a ring, is bigger than the integers, then we say that the lattice has complex multiplication. So this is really also where the name comes from, which is a bit weird, why complex multiplication? It's because we can multiply the lattice by something that's not real, not the integers, by some complex number, and we still stay in the lattice, okay? Um, and I think this observation probably goes back to, yeah, the 19th century, I would say, at least. Okay, so what does it have to do with uh, number theory? Or, I mean, we just looked at lattice or, or algebraic, um, sorry. Um, algebraic uh, geometry. So to each lattice, we can attach an elliptic curve. Okay, a curve of genus one with some uh, specified point at infinity. So I've written down sort of uh, a universal family, elliptic curves, the, the Legendre family here, um, which is parameterized by all lambda that uh, so sort of by the affine line minus zero and one. Okay. And uh, okay, so each such elliptic curve is isomorphic to C modulo a lattice. The isomorphism can be written down explicitly. It's actually given by Weierstrass p functions. So, so these elliptic functions that were constructed by Weierstrass is also a very classical subject. And um, <clears throat> what, uh, what, what, what comes up um, if we look at this particular family of Legendre curve, curves is uh, this particular group, gamma two. And um, I will just explain in a second why these are sort of elements in SL2Z. 
So integer matrices with determinant one. And this particular example was given by all the matrices that are congruent to the identity modulo two. Okay. And these um, uh, elements, these matrices, they act on the upper half plane by Möbius transformations. So in particular, because they are defined over R, they preserve the, the imaginary part being positive. So they really act on the upper half plane. And there is a covering map, this lambda function, I think is, is as it's known, it goes from the upper half plane. So, or one could say, so complex analytically, the disk to C without zero one. Okay. And this is kind of, uh, yeah, we will see this kind of structure a lot in this talk. And this lambda function has the property that it is invariant by the action of this group gamma, gamma two. And uh, so in particular, if you quotient out H by this gamma group, then we get C without zero one. So topology, so really C without zero one is isomorphic to H modulo this arithmetic subgroup of the group of symmetries of H. So all symmetries are given by SL2R and a particularly arithmetic subgroup gives us this curve. Okay, and what's also important is that this function lambda, it in particular, if we <clears throat> uh, translate tor by tor plus two, then we get lambda back. So this function lambda has a Fourier expansion, yeah? And this Fourier expansion I've written down some, uh, some terms is defined over the integers. So it has some arithmetic nature to it. It actually appears also in, in, in other uh, interesting conjectures, so some of them by Ramanujan, for example. And, uh, and it is basically given by, um, uh, this Fourier expansion is defined, uh, it's basically given as, by a series in Q and converges on the upper half plane. And this will be important for us later, this particular form of lambda, that we can write this lambda function down like this, as sort of an analytic function of an exponential function, but more, more about that later. Okay, so I've written it down. So you, yeah, the, as I said, this lambda, it, it induced an isomorphism, H modulo this arithmetic subgroup to, we call it Y2. Y2 is just a projective line minus three points. So let's just, as an aside, uh, this function lambda is also important, for example, to showing like these, I think it's called little Picard's theorem, that every entire function that emits uh, at least uh, two values is constant, yeah? Okay. And uh, the, here now we can, um, the first time this, this word appears, we can say that this, this curve Y of two is a Shimura variety, but um, I will talk about it a bit later. Okay, so <clears throat> because um, I think um, this E lambda is isomorphic to C modulo the lattice, each endomorphism of the lattice gives us an endomorphism actually of, of the elliptic curve. So an algebraic endomorphism. And we say that an elliptic curve has complex multiplication now, if its lattice has complex multiplication. And we can write down a specific condition for the lattice for, for this to hold, namely, if, the, if we write the lattice as Z plus Z tor, which we can always do after scaling, then uh, the, the lattice or the elliptic curve has complex multiplication. If there is a non-trivial element of SL2Z that fixes tor, okay? And um, <clears throat> we, if you write down an equation for this, then you find quickly that tor has to be an algebraic number, in fact, uh, so yeah, an algebraic number um, and is projectic imaginary, okay? So now actually these are the only numbers that are is algebraic that and whose value by lambda is also an algebraic number. This is a theorem by Schneider. And we already see kind of the connection to transcendence theory a bit. Of course, Schneider was a transcendental number theorist. Yeah? Okay. Um, there are some questions in the chat. No. Okay. All right. So, so far, so good. Now uh, we come to the first theorem, <clears throat> namely for Andre, who was mentioned before by uh, Andre. <clears throat> okay. So we have namely, we have these uh, uh, modular polynomials. These are polynomials defined over the integers and two variables. And they have the property that if I have two lambdas that vanish, 
Then the attached elliptic curves to lambda one, lambda two are isogenous, we say, and they're connected by an isogeny whose uh, uh, kernel has cardinality n, say, or even we can even say its kernel is a cyclic group of cardinality n. And okay, uh, I think at the end of the 90s, at least was published then, Andre, so Eve Andre, proved that if you take a curve in the affine plane, and you intersect it with um, all the invariants lambda one, lambda two, that correspond to CM elliptic curves, and you find infinitely many of those, okay, then your curve has to be special. Namely, it has to be a modular curve. So either uh, one coordinate is constant and is equal to a CM, uh, corresponds to a CM elliptic curve, or it defines a modular curve. So actually each point on the curve corresponds to two elliptic curve being isogenous. So, um, so how, how did he achieve this feat? He uh, used transcendence theory, in fact. So he used uh, very innovatively uh, the theorem of uh, yeah, linear forms, and logarithms, and he combined it with class field theory. It's a, uh, it's a very interesting development. I think, uh, I think it was a bit, uh, um, well, I probably claim too much here, but I think it was quite surprising to the community back then that, that this works. And um, <clears throat> however, the problem with the proof is, uh, even though people tried, I know some of, the, some of them, in fact, I haven't tried myself, it doesn't seem to extend to higher dimensions. So it is really restricted to curves, okay? So this is the first instance, I would say, of the Andre Ort, Andre Ort conjecture, okay? Which I will formulate a bit later. But if some of you are familiar with Mann and Mumford, this is really a direct analog of this. The Mann and Mumford conjecture says that the Tsarisky closure of torsion points is uh, a subgroup, is, is contain a finite union of subgroups, uh, say in the multiplicative group. And this is a very similar statement for CM points, or special points. Okay. Ari, uh, there's a question in the chat regarding um, Picard's uh, theorem, a little Picard's theorem. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, the question was why it was little Picard's, yeah, maybe I overdid it a bit with the connection, but if you want to prove little Picard, one way to prove it is to use the lambda functions that I just introduced, because it gives a, a cut, so if you remove from C to points, the covering map is, yeah, is a, a disk, which is, yeah, um, which can be put into a compact. Uh, or but is, is rather bounded, a bounded domain. Okay, uh, right. All right, so now we go to higher dimensions. So we take a product of, ellipt of, of y2 now, y to the n, and we can also define a special point. So here a special point is each coordinate corresponds to a CM elliptic curve. So now we're moving sort of from two to n dimensions. Okay, and there's this famous theorem of Pilar who proved, actually proved a, slight, a more general statement, but, but this is kind of what, what his theorem is known for. He proved that if you take any, any collection of special points, so that's each coordinate is, corresponds to a CM elliptic curve, you take the Tsarisky closure, then this Tsarisky closure is a finite union of special subvarieties. Special subvarieties are just products of special points and modular curves. Okay, maybe I should say what a Tsarisky closure is. So it basically means that if you take any algebraic variety in y to the n, you and you intersect it with a set of special points, then the intersection can be completely described by special subvarieties. So, for example, uh, it could be a finite union of modular curves. Okay, or it's it's a finite union of products of modular curves. Okay. okay. Now. <clears throat> Uh, what what did Pila use? What I mean, th this is, was a real breakthrough because uh, for for years there was only Andres uh, Andres theorem. Well, only there was Andres theorem. People tried to generalize it, and um, as I will say later, and, and Andre mentioned there were the, the, there were also other approaches. But what what Pila did was he used his counting theorem with Wilkie. So I, it is stated here. So there are some words that, that, that come up that I will explain. So the, the, the counting theorem is a very, very general theorem. 
it says that if you take any what is called definable set so definable means definable in some fixed omnium structure in the real numbers and you count the rational points on this x then you can bound its number sub polynomially so that means if you fix the height so say it here if you fit if you take a rational point on your x it's just some subset in the real numbers you take a rational point you bound its height which i denoted here which is the maximum of the numerator and denominator okay by some t then you get a bound that that is sub polynomial so you can beat any power of t what's important here though is that you have to remove some set of subset of x so you have to remove what is called uh, x alc and x alc is sort of the algebraic part of x so it's kind of surprising we want to do algebraic geometry but this theorem is important and you have to sort of throw out all of the algebraic parts the algebraic part is really everything that is positive dimensional can be described by uh, algebraic equalities okay or inequalities also yeah. okay um all right so so what i would also say the proof also allows to here we, we focus on q where you have the height you can also put in some number some fixed number field and what we we'll see later we can also count algebraic points of bounded degree and of course, you have then to extend the height from Q to the algebraic numbers in sort of the usual way, uh, which I hope is familiar to most of you. Okay. Now, okay, so more to the Pilar wiki uh, counting theorem, a bit to its history. It's inspired by a theorem of Bombieri and Pilar, I think at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, where they proved exactly this theorem, but only for transcendental curves. Transcendental curves are curves in R2 that are not zero sets of some polynomial and two variables, okay? And I think the idea, I think I, I heard that even the idea to get the sub polynomial bound is due to come from here. Um, but also intermediate results, so from curves to this very general theorem were previously obtained by Pila, for example, for surfaces, they were used by Massa and Zanje um, to obtain some of their theorems for relative man and proof. And, but, I think perhaps one of the great innovations of the theorem was that they introduced this very general theory of O minimality, which comes from logic, into this kind of counting theory. And as I said, I don't know much about this because I'm not a logician, but it was developed more or less, I think, by Vanden Dries Pillai. And of course, there are other names like Gabrielov and, as we say later, Wilkie McIntyre, who played a pivotal role in this. Okay, so I will very, very quickly explain how the proof goes. So you have this X, and I'll give some example later, which you can think of sitting in Rn, some, some, some let's, let's say analytic set. The first thing that you do is you cover it by smooth charts. So you don't assume X is, is um, definable in O minimal structure. It doesn't mean that it's smooth, but it's sort of piecewise smooth. And you can control the degree of smoothness depending on how, ma how many charts you put. So after you sort of parameterize your set, this is the first very difficult step. And I think the first work towards this also goes back to Gromov. <clears throat> then comes sort of an arithmetic part where you use the determinant method of Pila uh, that, that Pila introduced for the counting. Um, or yeah, as I mentioned below later, because it's important later, you can also use Sieg Sieg's lemma to show that all these points of bounded height are contained in an algebraic variety. And then you intersect this algebraic variety with your x. And this is, um, in fact, where the assumption comes in that you have to put that, that you have to uh, take out the algebraic part. Namely, if your x doesn't have any algebraic part, then this intersection will have lower dimension than x. Okay. If your x is not completely algebraic, you will cut down the dimension and then you repeat all of the arguments again. Okay. So this, this is roughly the idea. Okay. So now, oh, yeah, I have uh, messed up the pauses here. Okay, then, <clears throat> then uh, in order to prove his theorem, uh, Pila used uh, the so-called pila sanye strategy. So the pila sanye strategy was developed by both of them to give a new proof, in fact, of the Mann manfort conjecture for abelian varieties. Okay, so what's the idea? The idea is, 
You take a fundamental domain F for lambda. As I said, you have uh, the upper half plane. It's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, and you, but, but uh, you have sort of many, um, yeah, uh, Lambda is highly non-injective on it. It takes the same value quite often. For example, at tor and tor plus two, the same value. So you have to take a, a fundamental domain for Lambda on H, and it has to be a suitable fundamental domain. This is, you can't take any fundamental domain, but sort of the first one that comes to mind works. And then <clears throat> uh, you can show that for every quadratic imaginary tor, there is some tor in the fundamental domain such that its height is bounded, okay? And here M is some number that uh, doesn't really depend on anything, okay? So this, this was shown by Pila in this case. Then there is a, there's a theorem of Siegel that says that the, the, the number field generated by lambda of Tor for quadratic imaginary is bounded from below by a power of the discriminant, okay? Now we look at sort of the uniformization map of this product of mo uh, modular curves by the uh, upper half plane to the n. And this we do, it's given by each coordinate is just a lambda function, okay? And then we look at the inverse of an algebraic variety in y to the n in the upper half plane by pi and intersect it with the, um, with, with the fundamental domain, okay? So I, I denote this set by XV. So it's all the tors in the fundamental domain that map into our variety. Okay, what's important here is that because this whole O minimality theory is a real theory, we always sort of identify C with the real numbers in, in the obvious way, okay? But it's kind of a step that I will, uh, that I will skip. So this set XV is very important for the proof. Um, so, so first, um, <clears throat> XV is definable in the structure R on XP. So we have this XV, it's defined by this sort of complicated formula. So you have any algebraic variety, you take sort of all the tors that map into V. And what I'm saying is that even though it's complicated, there is a mathematical formalism that captures it. And it's actually this structure called R on XP. What is R on XP? It's sort of, you take the real numbers, you take all polynomials that you, yeah, over the reals, but you also adjoin sort of a finite number of analytic functions that are defined on some compact on R, okay? So power series in several variables that are defined on some compact and the exponential function that's in fact unbounded, okay? Now, if you look at lambda tor, this expansion, you see, it's actually an analytic function of Q, okay? You have some, uh, if, if you think of Q as some variable, then it's an analytic function of Q and Q itself, well, it's, if you restrict it to a fundamental domain, it sort of consists of the exponential function over the reals and uh, extended a bit, okay? So in fact, it's not hard to believe that this lambda is in fact in this structure, okay? But of course, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I skipped a lot. So if we don't move to the fundamental, if you don't restrict to the fundamental domain, this is not no longer true. It's not definable in this O minimal structure. Um, but yeah, what is an O minimal structure? I indeed, yeah. So I, I won't explain it in detail because it, it can takes, takes a while, but I, I will tell you how I think about it. So an OML structure is kind of a general, you can think of it as a bit of a generalization of uh, an algebraic variety. So most of what you're looking at are sort of equalities and inequalities of polynomials in analytic functions, at least in practice. Of course, the theory itself, if you want to develop it, you, it is much more complicated. So you allow, for example, to take any zero sets, then project it uh, and, um, and so forth. And you have to, uh, in order to tame it, you have to uh, to do a lot of work, um, which was luckily done by by Wilkie, and for this particular thing, extension of R and X done by Vandendries and McIntyre and Marker, and as soon as we have their work, we don't have to worry about anything. But to give you some intuition, I will give you sort of two examples of uh, sets that can be defined in an OMIL structure and 
or not. So the first set X1 is one that you might know from school. It's uh, the graph of the exponential function on the positive reals, yeah? Or actually, no, on all the reals, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have not uh, put the empty set here. So I just put an inequality to show that it, it doesn't really add any magic. So here, the graph of the exponential function is definable in normal structure, but it's of course a highly transcendental thing. So it's not, <clears throat> it's not given by an algebraic function. But if you take, for example, uh, x minus sine x to the graph of sine x uh, on the positives, it, this is not defined by an normal structure. So why is this? If you, for example, fix x1 to be, say, one half, you get an infinite discrete countable set. OK, and as soon as you have this, you have sort of a form of defining the integers. And if you can define the integers, then there's really no hope of any tameness. You can think of this, this, this at least is, is how I think about it. OK. All right. Um, so if there are no questions. OK, so so this this, this was sort of our, our short primer, and, uh, our short introduction to all mineral structures. Then. Uh, how how do we proceed okay so what i will explain now works uh, is again as i said is the is is the strategy of peel and sanye and it was first employed to give sort of an alternative proof of man and mumford really the the man and mumford for example proof by renault okay so you take a special point on your variety v in the product of modular curves then the first thing that I said was you can then find in the inverse, so on the in the fundamental domain of the upper half plane, you can find a quadratic imaginary or a tuple of quadratic imaginaries whose height is bounded by the discriminants of these points to some power m. Okay. Never mind that we have a tuple here. It's kind of it's exactly the same, same principle. And we fix the number few k as being q adjoined by this tau one up to 2n, which is just a number field. Okay. Now, if we want to, we can now apply the pila wilkie theorem to the inverse of V in this fundamental domain, okay? So we count the, because we have this height bound here, bound by discriminant, we can count these points and we get sub, a sub-polynomial bound on the number of points in the inverse, okay? Uh, bound by the discriminant. So here we can take any epsilon that we want, right? So we can beat any power of delta. All right, so that's the first part. All right, then the second one is, okay, by what I said before, we have a Galois lower bound, a polynomial Galois lower bound for the image of uh, this point in the, uh, in the upper half plane by lambda. So, or you can say for the special point, we have a Galois low bound in terms of the discriminant. Here I've taken one fifth, I could take one over 100, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that we have some positive power of the discriminant. Okay, now imagine that your V is defined over Q, some fixed number, if it doesn't really matter. Each of, you can now apply the Galois group, uh, the absolute Galois group over Q on V, and it will permute the special point P, okay? And fix V, uh, not permute, send P to, to another special point, but fix V. So that means that for each given special point of some given complexity given by the discriminant, you can find a positive power of the discriminant, many more special points on your variety V, okay? But this is in contrast to the bound that Pila Wilkie gives you, namely that you, you have this sub-polynomial bound here, okay? So if we compare the two, the upper bound given by Pila Wilkie and the lower bound given by uh, the, Galois, the Galois bound. So you have just put an M because we have some tuple, okay? Um, then if we choose epsilon small enough, we can, we can get a bound for the discriminant, delta, all right? And uh, here delta is we have a tuple can be served with the maximal discriminants of uh, tau one up to M, okay? But as soon as we bound the discriminant, we are finished. We have only finitely many special points in V. So in particular, it's risky closure is uh, of special points uh, is finite. Uh, it contained in V, excuse me, is finite. Uh, sorry, the intersection of V with the special points is finite. So that finishes the proof. 
but uh, well, but that can't be the story. That can't be true. Why? Because, for example, if V is a product of modular curves, there are infinitely many special points in it. As, as I, if, if you, as I explained before, if you have a modular curve, uh, then say then the coordinates will be isogenous to each other. So if one coordinate is uh, is given is, has complex multiplication, the other coordinate will have complex multiplication as well. Okay. So I've omitted a certain step. And this will be uh, comes next is uh, called functional transcendence. Okay, so how do we know that this this set that that I define the inverse of v intersected with the fundamental domain is not completely algebraic? It could be an algebraic variety, a real algebraic variety. Okay, <laughs> and this is I think well I would yeah more say this is probably yeah one of the really um, significant innovations that uh, in that paper of Pilar, where he proved the Andreot conjecture for products of modular curves, is that he showed that if you take some algebraic set in the upper half plane and you apply the uniformization map, you take the Tsaristic closure, it will be a product of points and modular curves. So he described sort of uh, the sets that are algebraic on the cover and whose image is algebraic. Okay, so um, I think Ulmo, uh, who, <clears throat> who I've heard many, many uh, fantastic talks on this about, uh, called this bialgebraic, although I'm not sure who exactly uh, coined this term, bialgebraic. Okay. So in some sense, for the experts, it means that bialgebraic varieties, the ones that are algebraic on the cover and in the image, are weakly special, what it's called. In this context, weakly special means a product of points and modular curves. Okay, so this is what Pila proved. How did he do this? So I think this this is one of the uh, one of the uh, yeah. <laughs> I heard this back as a student, and I was really struck by this proof. So what he did is he he used the pila wilkie counting theorem again to prove this transcendence theorem. And just to make uh, some uh, some comment on the proof. One of the difficulties of his proof is to show that if you have some algebraic variety um, that intersects the, um, the upper half plane, that inter intersects many, many fundamental domains in the upper half plane. It's kind of an interesting part of the proof, and it's actually one of the difficulties in wh when uh, the proof of Pilar was attempted to be generalized, yeah? which I will um, talk about later. OK, so now. Pila has um, now Pila has obtained uh, after Pila has obtained the Andreot question y, y two to the n question is okay how how do we proceed? So <clears throat> the Andreot conjecture itself is about Shimura varieties, which uh, the product of modular curves is one of those. But um, of course there are much uh, there are many more. I will not give a definition. I will just say they are they are in general given by some Hermitian domain. Uh, Hermitian, sorry, sim, yeah, I think it's Hermitian symmetric domain rather H, um, and we quotient out by an arithmetic subgroup of its symmetries, and um, they have the properties. These 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 objects they satisfy certain axioms that were, were rigorously specified by Delinier, and these axioms they ensure that actually this quotient is an algebraic uh, variety. Which was actually proven by um, Bailey Borel, as far as I know. And uh, yeah, just as an example, above we had the upper half plane as our uh, Hermitian symmetric domain, and the arithmetic subgroup was gamma two. Yeah. Okay. So these uh, these subgroups, as you said. Yeah, and I would just want to say, uh, even even to show that that these varieties, firstly, are algebraic varieties. It's kind of Bailey Borel. And that they have a model of a, a number field. I mean, there's lots of work uh, who, who goes in there uh, by Boroboy, for example, Linie, uh, uh, Milne, and so forth. Okay. All right. But what we always have on S is that we have special points that these are kind of um, analogs of CM points, points with a lot of symmetry, and they have some attached complexity, like uh, the discriminant of. Uh, the, the endomorphism ring uh, of, of, a, of an elliptic curve. And we have higher dimensional special sub varieties 
And these are kind of Shimura varieties or sub-Shimura variety in a fixed Shimura variety. Like for in the example y2 to the n, these were modular curves or products of modular curves contained in y2 to the n. Okay. And of course, a famous example of a Shimura variety is the moduli space of abelian varieties. Yeah, this is probably the mo most the best studied, studied uh, Shimura variety. And of course, there we have the Siegel upper half plane and and and, and uh, it's the theory of, uh, and Siegel, Siegel already worked on this. Okay, so uh, one of the, <clears throat> I think why people got initially interested in this is also the Torelli locus. So here I, I just wrote it sort of sim MG, sort of if you look at the moduli space of curves of genus G, you can attach its Jacobian to it and this gives you a point on AG. So you can embed sort of the moduli space of curves of genus G into AG. This is called the Torelli locus. And one can show that if G is at least four, then MG is not a special subright. Or it's actually not everything after G is equal four. And uh, I think I'm not sure about this. So correct me if I'm wrong, if someone knows. I think Ort especially was especially interested in this kind of uh, questions connected to, to Torelli locus. Okay, so what does the andre conjecture state in general? It states if you take the Tsariski, the Tsariski closure as any set of special points is a finite union of special subvarieties. Okay, this is a very simple, very elegant conjecture. One consequence is, okay, if you should know, if we know in addition that, for example, the Torelli locus doesn't contain any special subvarieties, which is not always true, but if, say, for some G, it is true, then you have shown that for this G, there is no smooth curve whose Jacobian has complex multiplication. Uh, sorry, there are only finitely many smooth curves whose Jacobian has complex multiplication. Okay, so there, there are sort of direct uh, applications to algebraic geometry. Okay, so <clears throat> to apply the Pilasania strategy in general, to so we want to prove now the Andrade conjecture, we need three, roughly three ingredients. Okay, the first, I would say, yeah. Well, no, I won't say anything. Is polynomial lower bounds for Galois orbits? This was open the longest. The second, functional transcendence. This I have talked about in length before. And the third is what we had before that you, you have to show that each special point has a, an image in a suitable fundamental domain, a pre image, sorry, whose height is bounded. Okay. So the second part, functional transcendence, which is often called functional ex Lindemann. And I'm sorry if I omitted someone here. But I think um, the first is for, for AG, this functional transcendence statement that is needed is was proven by Pilat Zimmermann and then later um, in, 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 yeah, for, for, for all Shimura varieties by Klingler, Ulmo, and Yafayev using also um, Pilat's strategy. And, um, <clears throat> okay. And, right, the problem three so the height bound for the pre images was completely solved by Dornor. Now, I should also say before we go further that actually um, a proof of a complete proof of the Andrade conjecture, however, assuming the general Riemann hypothesis, was given by Klingler and Yafayev using equidistribution techniques. And as Andre mentioned, there was important input by Edixhoven. However, I don't know the um, history of this exactly, but I think also important input by Ulmo. But as I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on this part. So, Harry, uh, with yeah. a question in the chat regarding um, the complexity. Yeah. Uh, it's going to always defined E. Yes, that, that's a fantastic uh, question. So if you have a CMAB and variety attached to it, then yes, it's sort of, you can uh, think about it as discriminant of the endomorphism rings. In general, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that you can actually attach some objects with endomorphisms to it. But yeah, maybe, maybe there's some, yeah. Maybe Andre can answer this. Ah, ah great. One, one, one person said one half is possible in theory. Thank you. Ah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I knew I messed up. Okay. All right. So is this okay? Is the, so in AG, the answer is yes to the, to the last question. Okay. So now, we come to, yeah, I, I put a timestamp on it this time because, uh, yeah, it's already, well, seven years almost. So we have uh, Zimmermann proved the, the third part. So as I said, 
we had the second and third part are, were already done. Now the, the first part remained for AG and Zimmerman proved it. And yeah, I wrote written down the statement like this. Yeah. So you have this complexity, which is given as, as was mentioned in the case of CMS as the uh, discriminant more or less of the endomorphism ring of the, the, the beam variety with complex multiplication. And uh, all right, so how does this proof works, uh, work? There's two crucial ingredients. Yeah? One, which I would say is averaged Colmes conjecture, which I explain in a second. And the second are the isogeny estimates for abelian varieties, okay? So what, what both have in common is that they are completely restricted to abelian varieties, okay? So you can't go from AG using these two ingredients, you can't go from AG to other Shimova varieties. Okay, so I would just say the average Comets conjecture as Andre, I think Andre men uh, mentioned it, it um, connects the logarithmic derivative of certain RT L functions, so like uh, analytic objects attached, attached to uh, the endomorphism ring of an abelian variety to the faulting side of the abelian variety. And uh, when it has complex multiplication, and uh, so Colmes conjecture is, I think, is, is stronger than the average Colmes conjecture, but the average Colmes conjecture is sort of enough for the application. And it was proven by Yuan and Zhang and independently also by Andrea Tago and Howard and Pera. And I, uh, I think also the methods of both proofs were really distinct. So uh, they, they came up with two uh, independent proofs. Okay, so this is number one. And second, isogeny estimates, of course, if people are not familiar, this is part of transcendental number theory. Yeah. Um, and uh, for example, I, I think they, they were more or less created in an attempt to, to uh, make parts of Modell's conjecture effective. Okay. All right. So as a consequence of the average columnist conjecture, we get a height bound on a uh, special point. So here, H stands for some logarithmic while height on HG. So it really a height in the traditional sense, let's say. And it gives you a bound that is subpolynomial the discriminant. Now we want to generalize these two ingredients. Now, <clears throat> uh, so we have the average columnist conjecture which restricted restrict to abelian varieties, and we have the isogeny estimates that are restricted to abelian varieties. So how do we overcome these restrictions? And the answer for the isogeny estimates is, well, we just do more counting. Now I just want a sidetrack is the, the Pila-Wilkie theorem holds for any O minimal structure, but Wilkie already shortly after they proved it, or maybe even before, uh, formulated this conjecture that in this particular structure Rx, so if you only adjoin the exponential function, a polylock bound should hold. So you should get actually, instead of t to the epsilon for the number of rational points, you should get a, a, a polynomial in the logarithm of uh, the height, okay? So um, the observation, um, so there were some proofs of some special cases by Gibbs Jones, Margaret Thomas, uh, Binyamini, Pila, and, uh, but they, they, they also, they, they were mostly concerned with Q, or when you attach the number field, the dependence on the number field was actually exponential. And uh, my observation was back then that e each time you can sort of prove this, you can prove a polylock bound that is, yeah, that is um, polynomial in the degree of the number field that you put in. Okay. <clears throat> this comes sort of from how, how it's proven. Um, I'm running a bit uh, late, so I will uh, do this a bit faster just say that <clears throat> it's part two where you intersect your x with an algebraic variety if you have some control on the intersection then you you can improve on the pila wilkie bound and this is how most of the proofs go um, and i should say excuse me i uh, i've forgotten to say that actually a proof of this uh, was put on the archive by binyamini novikov and zak i think this week so it's quite so you need some, and in fact, what you can do, you can also, instead of count uh, points in a fixed number field, you can count po algebraic points of a fixed degree over Q, and you still get sort of a polynomial bound. So what's the idea? 
So the first observation, which when, when, when I saw this, I, I was quite struck by it, which is if we know on the Shimura variety, this is, um, follow, we know that given some uh, special point, we can find polynomially many in the discriminant other special points defined over a number field that has the same degree as the number field that is generated by my point. Okay, it's a bit of a complicated same, but sort of given one point, we can find many. Okay, so this is always true. In the case of uh, modular curves, this is already enough to get, uh, to get a Galois bound. But in the general case, it's not. And the idea is now to look at the graph of the uniformization map. Okay, so we know that the height of the pre image is bounded by, by the theorem of Do and Or. And if we knew that the height on the image is also sub bounded sub polynomially in the discriminant, then we can use uh, we can use the upper bound coming from the counting traded off with the lower bound coming from this observation to get a lower bound on the degree of the number field generated by P by the special point that is polynomial in the discriminant, okay? But what we need is we need this log T, this pesky log T needs to be bounded, okay? So what uh, Benjamini uh, and Yafaya we've shown is that we've shown that if you have a special point, then you get a, a polynomial lower bound for the degree of the number field generated by P if you have a bound on the height. So this replaces the isogeny estimates of Massa and Wüstholz and gives a new proof, in fact, of Andre Ort, already gave a new proof of Andre Ort for AG. Um, but of course, to, to, have the, to, to have the full Andre Ort conjecture, you also need a height bound. And this was shortly after then um, put on archive by Pila Shankar Zimmerman, Esnol, and Gröchig. And they proved the necessary height bound. So you can hear for the HM, you can uh, plug in something that is sub polynomial in the discriminant. So you can bound this, uh, you can beat this M by far and then divide and you get a, uh, a polynomial lower bound for your, for your field. And yeah, this completes the proof of the underworld conjecture. Yeah. So hooray. Okay, um, I'm not sure, Philip, how much time do I have left? Well, maybe a few more minutes. A few more minutes, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So maybe just to finish up, um, if nobody has question, what else is there to do for Andre Ort? Um, so if you want to go to mixed Shimura varieties, there's, well, bad news if you want to do something new, because Gao uh, or Siang has shown that this, uh, the, the Andre Ort conjecture for mixed Shimura varieties holds also. Or, but he, he has kind of reduced it to the Andre Ort for pure Shimura varieties. Uh, back in the day, so I think five years ago, six years ago. Even. But an, a big open question is whether we can actually find an effective proof. So I want to advertise a bit for that. So can we actually find, given an algebraic variety, find all the special points and special sub varieties contained in that variety? And there is some, um, there's some progress has been made by uh, many people, but mostly for the case Y2 to the N. And yeah, we just, uh, yeah, uh, announced maybe a theorem that they will come out soon where we reduce the effectiveness of the Andre Ort conjecture for a product of Legendre curves to effectiveness for a product of modular curves. Here we use uh, the, also the theory of Pfeffian fu functions and uh, some work of Gareth Jones and, Ma and myself and I. Okay, and maybe just to finish up, I want to say, that uh, the, there is Pink's conjecture, which is on mixed Shimura, is a vast generalization. Basically, yeah, includes almost all known conjectures in diophantine geometry, like model conjecture, Mann Mumford conjecture. There are similar conjectures by Bombieri, Mas, and Zanye, uh, like they were formulated in par parallel, and also by Zilba. What I want to say is also that Zilba was inspired by model theoretic questions, which I think is quite interesting in itself. And he was interested in uh, a model theoretic approach to Shanwe's conjecture. So there, there are very interesting connections here. Um, here's a sort of a formulation of Pink. 
If you just read it through, you will see that if you replace special sub varieties of Kodamish, at least dim V plus one by special points, you get exactly the Andre Ort conjecture. And uh, okay. And uh, yeah, I just want to say there, there are some cases that were proved, for example, uh, by Barruero, Massazanie, um, Habega, Pila, um, who proved certain cases of, in fact, Pink's conjecture. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to hear is, a, is also a formulation of Shanwe's conjecture. And um, <clears throat> maybe I finish up here now. I just want to say that there are many interesting connections here, especially between this functional transcendence and transcendence theory and logic. And uh, it has already led to many fruitful collaborations. And yeah, I am hope I am hopeful that this will continue. And yeah, thank you very much.